Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to people around the world. This is Martin Hubel, your host of the DB2 Night Show, and we're up to show number 252 uh, for DB2 LUW, and about 133 on uh, System Z. So that's an awful lot of education and an awful lot of shows over the last 14 years. It's fantastic. Uh, once again, we have Michael Tiefenbacher back with us. Uh, how are you today, Michael? Hi, Martin. Good to be on your show. Thanks. I'm very good. I'm fine. Great. Yeah. Now, our audiences these days can be a little smaller, but on the other side, we still have a tremendous number of downloads. I think we're up to over 3 million downloads now. So, uh, with the people that join us, you'll have some opportunities to participate. And, uh, and uh, other people that are listening to it after the fact, that's great too. So let me get the housekeeping out of the way so they can listen to you, because you're more important than I am. Uh, once again, our social media, Twitter, I, uh, and uh, we have replays available on YouTube uh, now, which is a thing that's easy for me to set up. And so if you follow the Twitter handle, you'll know when the replays are available. I normally get those available within an hour of the show being done. The rest of it requires uh, some PHP and other such things that take me a little longer to process. And sometimes I get that done on Friday, and sometimes it's a couple of days later, depending on how busy my, uh, my uh, rest of my life is. Uh, our famous disclaimer, uh, we're recording things, we respect copyrights, we love you all, and uh, anything that you participate in can be recorded. Just keeping that in mind, and it's all owned by DBI. So here's our quick announcements. Our upcoming shows, I've got a couple more in here now. Um, uh, we've got today's show, I meant to take that off, because I normally remember that, but you know, I'm good at forgetting things. There's my typo for today. Uh, next month, we have Phil Nelson of Lloyds Bank, TSB. Uh, he's up in Scotland. He'll be presenting uh, DB2 UDFs going beyond the basics. So that should be a great session. And in April, we have John Hornibrook uh, from the Toronto Lab talking on query optimization. And yes, everybody loves John, and he does a great job. Uh, I'm still looking for May 12th and uh, June 2nd. Uh, simply because I just haven't got around to it yet. I've got uh, a couple of good friends in mind. Hopefully they'll be available and we'll finish off the year with a big bang. Uh, on the on the System Z side, uh, later this month, we have Roy Boxwell back from uh, Software Engin Engineering Group in Germany or you know, Segus in the US. And an audited day keeps the lawyers at bay. And uh, that'll that's our show for this month. Uh, we, I've also added in Mariella Wyrock from the uh, uh, IBM Silicon Valley Lab uh, talking about uh, uh, application contexts and profiles uh, in April. And uh, we've got uh, Sonia Kamaswaran from the IBM SVL in June. I'll fill up the uh, March and uh, May date shortly. Uh, as always, uh, DBI is the founding sponsor of the DB2 Night Show, and I encourage you to uh, go out and learn more about their DB2 LUW performance products. They also now support SQL Server. So if you're a SQL Server DBA and need some performance tools, DBI can be your source for that as well. And our winner uh, uh, last time was uh, Russell Peters of Central Bank. Congratulations, Russell. You. Uh, have received an Amazon gift certificate. Thanks for watching and being a regular regular member of our studio audience. And again, our sponsors are DBI and yours truly. And with that, we'll do our polls quickly and then we'll be able to turn things over to Michael. And a standard question as we always uh, run it, which is uh, which uh, versions of DB2 are you currently running? This is, I believe, a select all that apply. And uh, nice to see you today. We always seem to have one or two that are a little 
uh, lagging behind. That does not mean that you're slow. It just means that your applications are really important and maybe you're waiting for vendor support prior to moving onwards. With that, I'll close that off and share the results. And uh, mm. there we have it. But the good news is that uh, an awful lot of our audience has moved to the later versions of uh, DB2. And uh, we're all waiting with uh, with uh, bated breath for version 12 to actually come out and be available. Uh, I've been kidding my friends uh, for, for years. There's something called fear of the number 13, which is tristedecaphobia. And there's something that's far <laughs> less common, which is, <laughs> have you never heard that? Uh, no. Uh, but there's another one called dodecaphobia, which is fear of the number 12. Yeah. I've always wondered about uh, if they actually just had a fear of that number. You know, it, apparently it's quite rare, but people can have a fear of the number 12. Okay, let's move along and hide that and do the next poll, which is uh, how would you rate your SQL skills? And uh, that could be the expert in, the in, the, in your company, or you use advanced functions. <laughs> Very pleased that somebody saw, found some humor in the last one there. Every now and then we just have to try to keep people awake. I, I was going to put up a put up a little video today of my dogs running around in the snow, as I mentioned in the past. Uh, Lily and Lacey are uh, Chihuahuas rescued from uh, Texas, where they uh, they apparently uh, they're the second most euthanized dogs in Texas. So we were happy to rescue a couple up here and you wonder what a, a Texas dog would do with snow and apparently they just have a good time out there. They don't like rain though. They hate rain. You know, they, mm. They're you know, from a dry climate and they, when they see rain, they just, no. <laughs> but with snow, they, they, they have a good time. I'll put that video up next month. It is kind of cute. Okay, with that, let me uh, close that and uh, we'll share that. And, uh, We've got a lot of experts here, and that's great to see. I wouldn't expect too many people on the DB Tonight show to be beginners, but uh, that's great. Okay, with that, let me uh, move on and uh, go back to the screen here, and I'll turn things over to you, uh, Michael. We'll, uh, Thanks, Martin. You should have that message on your screen right now. I'm going to shut off my webcam to give people back some bandwidth and uh, uh, that'll make it easy. And uh, we're going to try a couple of things today where we uh, have allow people to participate a little more. So we'll see how that goes. This is going to be new for me, but I, I'll be uh, uh, following the uh, attendees and seeing if there's some way I, uh, we can have people raise their hands. There's a, a, a selection that allows you to raise your hand and we can turn your mic on and you can ask questions directly to, to Michael as we go through things. So. With that, take it away, uh, Michael. I will mute myself as well, just to keep any background noise out of the way here. Okay, fantastic. Thanks, Martin. So, um, welcome everyone to my session, uh, SQL Traps and Solutions. It's a part of my SQL in Action series. And um, yeah, I'm happy to share some of my thoughts and ideas and solutions with you. In order to start, we give you a little overview uh, of the, uh, today's agenda. We're starting with a little introduction motivation section. Why did I make up this presentation? Um, then we have a deeper look into a couple of, of problem scenarios, like a group by problem, starting pretty, pretty basic. I'm going to more advanced stuff later on. Um, looking at all problems and all up functions, um, have a deeper look into a outer joint confusion, as I called it and we will care about nulls in the end as well. So I hope you enjoy this session and my my goal is to to give you some ideas or, or some inspiration to look into some things a little deeper and maybe to avoid a couple of problems because um, I, I do SQL on a daily basis. I'm, I'm working in data warehouse projects. I'm a, I'm a consultant and um, in, in data warehouse environments, you really do a lot of SQL stuff, also ETL and others, but uh, knowing SQL is, is really a, um, a huge benefit. And SQL is so powerful. It's, it's such a mighty 4GL language. And 
you can do more things and more advanced things with um, SQL than most uh, people would ever expect. And so by, by handling uh, SQL every day, I, I of course step across some problems every day. And um, some, some small changes uh, which you thought would be trivial can have a huge effect and also can make things worse. And uh, well, this should show some, some, um, some experience in order to, to ease finding some hidden errors. And it's, at least in my case, I step across some problems more than once. And it's always good to remember, well, I know the solution for this one. And that's why I wanted to, to share these traps and solutions with you today. So in, in order to warm up a little bit, and as Martin said, I like to get more interactive. Um, what's wrong with this simple statement? You see, that's a, a simple select statement with only a couple of, of, of lines of code. And uh, it, it is filtering on a change date where change date is null. But as obviously, as you see in the result, the change date is null in my results. So what happened? So, so Martin, help me out. So the customer, the, the attendees could, could raise a hand or something uh, uh, and can be unmuted and, and speak up. Who, who sees what's wrong with this statement? So just, just try. Raise, raise your hand and, and I think Martin will unmute you. Martin, right? I am right here and I'm looking. Uh, nobody's raised their hand yet. Come on, guys. Not yet. Oh, come on. Look at that. It's just a couple of lines. Is but actually, it is, it is expected. It is not easy to see because it, it, it just refers to what I just said. Little things can have a yeah. huge effect. Any ideas? If not, I could could solve it for you. But uh... <laughs> making people think this is pretty early in the morning for some people on the west coast. Well, you know? yes, yes, and uh, some for some even pretty pretty uh, late afternoon already yes, here in Germany. Yes, where you are, yes. <laughs> so this seems strange. So you look at that. Look at the tiny things, and. As you see in, in, in the select statement, you select uh, basically four columns, but only three are returned or are shown at least. So maybe oh, yes, yeah, the it's, change date is not it's a little misleading. Yeah, you because put around it to fool people, but you forgot a you forgot a uh, comma there after creation date. I for, I forgot a comma there. Yeah, that's right. What what happened here? It says creation date, and there is the comma is missing. And the creation date has an alias, which is change date. Yes. And we say just change date is null, but another column, creation date, is named change date, and that's why we get returned some information. Yes. So this is pretty pretty nice example for showing that little things can have a huge effect. It is it is completely normal that you look at this and say, well, what happened here? I can't think of any, I don't see any, any problem. But it's the little comma missing here, which makes up a completely different um, result set. Okay, so because nobody says that you can't rename a column in any way, uh, you can also do this in, in, you can also use change date with which, oh, sorry, which by the way was really a, a real column in the in the in the original insurance table I had. Okay, so this is just one of the examples, one of the motivation stuff to to show how how difficult uh, it is sometimes to find the little things that change the complete result. Okay, so let's go on. And uh, sometimes it also are there are also syntax problems, and and we we are not going. To, to dive deeper into this, but uh, syntax errors are reported uh, by, by DB2 right away once you run your statement. And the other day I, I had this really curious thing. Um, I got a SQL 183 error saying a daytime arithmetic operation is, is not in a valid range of dates. And it was, it was actually a complex SQL statement. 
And this error happened when I added an additional filtering condition aware where the column datum, which is just the German word for date, equals uh, the 12th September 21. And before you ask, yes, datum is a date column, so this is, seems to be pretty good. So why didn't it run successfully? Without that, by, when I left that where condition out, it ran with no problems. By adding this where condition, it failed. Okay, seems, seems a little bit of strange, but I can tell you this really happened. And what happened? I had to track it deeper down. I had to explain stuff and, and that's what I found. Within my SQL, within the complex SQL, there was a, a condition which was next week of date or datum minus one day. Well, this is pretty pretty fine. It was part of a common table expression, and within the table table ex, uh, common table expression, the data was reduced, uh, limited down to the current year. So everything was fine. But in my date column, my datums column, we also had values um, uh, or the minimal date, which is the first January of the year one, and you can't subtract one day from from that. So it, it really happened that because I added the additional filtering condition in the where, the SQL optimizer rearranged the query and, and, and evaluated differently. And, and it did not filter to the current year um, before he uh, subtracted the one day from, from the minimal date. And that's why I ran into the problem. This is curious because the where condition of the filtering condition I added is, is just fine. It's, everything is okay, everything is valid, just the optimizer changed his evaluation and data access strategy and this, this led to this error. So curious, but not our focus today. We are not talking about syntax problems today. We are talking about SQL problems and, and semantical problems. Okay, so let's move on. Let's look deeper into one of the first examples, the group by problem. And I guess you all know this error message. Uh, it is, it, I step across this every every week, uh, probably, or every other week. Uh, it's, it's very common, it is speaking, so it, it pretty much tells you right away what's wrong. You forgot something in your group by clause, having column functions, and it didn't do the group by right. So I think um, every one of you have, has seen that before and stepped across that before. So this seems pretty basic. You all know what to do and what to check, but maybe we have a closer look into that one. And this is again, something where you can participate. So starting up with a very, very basic, very simple example. What about this one? Will this query work? Raise your hand. Don't be shy, no problem. I, I think you all know that. It's pretty straightforward. Anyone? No? Okay, so. Well, I'll, inter I'll interact with you. I guess I need to be the guinea pig. Okay, so I what do you think? I would think that would work. Yes, you're right, this will work because all the columns are, are column functions, so we don't need a group by, it's on the whole table, so we get the sum salary of the whole table. Yes. So, next thing. Nope. We add a work depth column. This is the typical problem we just talked about, isn't it? Yes. Ah, so, this won't work because we don't have a group by. So, in, in this case, we will run into this problem. So, these are the two easy parts. And um, let's go on. I have a, a couple of more, more examples. What about this? So it's exactly the same. We added a group by, but we don't. We didn't say group by work. We say group by one. Will this one work? Let's get a little bit more tricky. So remember, you can raise your hand. You can be unmuted, and you can participate. Otherwise, Martin has to step in again. 
Well, this is not easy, I would guess, because okay. I don't know who has already tried that one. Because if yeah. you do an order by one, order by one would work. Mm -hmm. but a group by one? Not so much. <laughs> not so much. You're right. A group by one doesn't work. Okay, let's go on. What about this one? Select two as ID and then do some calculation and do a sum and having no group by. Will this one work? Well, hmm. these are not columns in a the table. These are just more or less constants. Mm -hmm. So this will work actually. Yes. Yeah. So you don't need this if you don't reference to other columns, if, if, if they are static, if it's always the same um, result, for, for all of the rows, it's no problem, it will work. So let's do the last one. It's, it's pretty useless, but it's interesting somehow. So it did the same, but we do a group by one and two. Remember, the group by one did not work. What about if I do a group by one and two here? Well, actually, I, I, I don't think anyone has tested that before. This is kind of weird but this really would work. Uh, and this is crazy because these are constants, this would work. It doesn't make any sense, by the way. At least I don't know any use case for that. And, and I don't see any value in it, but it, 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 it just works. It works the same way as if you leave that one out. Okay, so it's, it's sometimes simple things that can be, can get complicated. Okay, let's go on. I have another, example of a group by. So in this um, this uh, time, these two question marks are just a placeholder or the, the blue rectangle is just a placeholder. What needs to go in the group by in order to work? So we, we do have, we have two column functions and we do have a case statement. So could I do um, group by higher range? which is the name of the column here. Well, at that point, higher range is not yet known. So this won't work. What would work is if you repeat the case statement. So if you do group by case, this would work. Me personally, I of course copy the stuff down there and I very often forget to to remove the as higher range. If you would add an as higher range here, it won't work. But if you remove this, if, if you end it with the end, then it's fine. This would work, but there's a better way to do it. Because this is a lot of coding and you're generating a, a bigger SQL than you really need because you, you have these case statement two times in, in, in a single statement. This is not very, very, useful if you want to change something, you have to change it in, in two locations. And this is only a pretty basic example, just some, some lines of code. Imagine that your SQL statement is one, two, three, four pages. So you have to, to go through a lot of code in order to find the second case statement to adjust it once you need, you need to modify the, the case scenario. Okay, so the better way to do it is this would work. The better way to do is 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 this way. You you do the select in a in a in a SQL statement. So you only code your case once. Okay. So just a single place to change if you need to change any of the case logic. That's better. And interestingly, this is even necessary in some cases. It is necessary if within the case you use a non-deterministic functions like randomize or stuff like that, because it's just executed once. It's coded once, it's executed once. This is the better solution. Okay. Talking about group buys, talking about problems. I just want to give you some, some uh, side information. It's, it's not about problems, but I want to point you out to some very interesting stuff. We don't go into detail, but I really want to make you aware of group by. So this is a little side information. Uh, there's a lot more about group buys than you might think. I don't know if you've heard about grouping sets. 
grouping sets allow to do group buys, different group buys without having different statements combined with a union with a union all. And even more more useful or more complicated or more fancy is supergroups like Rollup and Cube. These are fantastic functionalities in order to evaluate the data from different viewpoints. Uh, uh, this is this is fantastic stuff. And um, it is also in, uh, very, very efficient. I, I learned that in one of Callisto Sosarch's presentations and because it, it uses only a single scan through your data. So it's, it's a really efficient stuff. You know that? It is there in DB2 for a long time. Any idea, Martin, when it, when it was added to DB2 LEW? Sorry, I was uh, writing an email. I'm... So, uh, sorry, so, <laughs> well, it's unfair from my side. <laughs> yeah, I was, uh... Super, uh, like group by cube and group by rollup. How long uh, have you seen that in DB2? When was it well, edited? At least uh, uh, version eight uh, or, uh, or version seven almost. Been I would. I. I. I'm not hundred percent sure, but I would take bets uh, that it was added even in version five. Oh, uh, okay. so, you know, there. Yeah. Okay. It. It could so, very well be. It certainly wasn't it, version well, six. It. It's hard to find documentation from version five nowadays. So, uh, but. But I. I really. I think I remember it was added a long time ago. Yeah, so it's yeah. not very well known. If you. Yeah. If. If you. Just want to look into this. These are really useful functions and functionalities. Check it out. This yes. is just side information. Well, this is, these are the, the, some of the most important things are the uh, uh, cube and roll up, particularly roll up. Yeah, really cool. So, to our next point on the agenda, it's about OR problems. Let's check this one out. So, we have two, two SQL statements, they are pretty similar. They have the same conditions, and is there a difference? And what's the difference? So we do have this example is just running on our simple employee table of the sample database of DB2, and we want to to have the at level eighteen, the the uh, sex M, and work depth A zero zero. So the only difference is the sequence of the conditions. So uh, the sex is always ORed and the other is always not and with AND and stuff. Is it the same or is it different? Well, if he asked that way, there might be, there's a good chance that there's a difference, right? So looking at that, it, it, there is a difference. Uh, the number of rows returned is completely different. 26 and 27 rows, why that? Let's check that one out because the evaluation sequence is different between AND and OR and NOT. So NOT is, is evaluated first and then AND and OR last. So I, I, um, I marked the, I highlighted the brackets which, is in, which, are, which are implicitly used or from, from the sequence of, of the, um, of the filter conditions. So in, in this case, it says you can have at level 18 or uh, your sex is M and you're not A00. And this is what returned. This is just a sample of the result set, of course, just to make clear uh, what, what you see here. And in the lower example, uh, it, where at level is 18 and uh, you're not in A00 or all the uh, males. Okay, so you see um, different results, different use case, uh, and, and therefore I really, really encourage you to use the parentheses around around ORs and or ANDs as needed. Uh, whenever there's an OR involved, I, I suggest you do um, uh, use parentheses in order to make clear what you what you need. You might be a pro. Uh, and you might be aware of this order, evaluation order, and you use it by intention, but it's really hard to understand and read um, if you don't use any any brackets uh, and uh, parentheses and 
uh, I really recommend this because if, if anybody else reads that SQL statement later on, nobody knows if it's just there by intention or not if, you, if, you, if parentheses are missing. So please use it. It's an easy thing and it makes it so much easier to read and to understand. Um, please use this. And I got another side information for you. Did you know that following conditions are equal? You can say we're worked at A00 and at level 19 and sex is male or M. And it's absolutely the same as you, you specify all the columns in, in brackets and, and the results in brackets. I don't know if it's, it's readable any better. I don't think so. You're, um, you're saving a, a little bit of typing maybe. Uh, I, I would not recommend this actually, um, but this is useful if you don't specify the concrete values here, but you can do of course a select um, from, from another table here. And then you need this, then it's very, very, very useful. Okay, so just just another side information before we go on. The next point I want to talk about is OLAP functions and OLAP function evaluation. So in general, I love OLAP functions. They are in most of my presentations. I've done a lot of presentations in this um, SQL in Action series for, for IDUX, IDUX conferences, which are really highly recommended here as well. And I think OLAP functions are extremely useful because if you use them, you don't need to do the group by and you're avoiding the group by problems we've just seen in, in one of the previous um, chapters. And uh, they also provide great performance. I have seen a couple of people uh, when I talk to them about OLAP functions that, that yeah, I know there are OLAP functions, but I think uh, the performance is not good. And the opposite is true, actually. They show great performance. I've used them in situation where I have hundreds of millions of rows and it was much faster than anything else. So they are highly efficient in DB2. Um, don't think uh, to avoid them because of, of performance reasons. In, in, uh, it will gain performance. That's, that's all my experience. So it's really absolutely great stuff and they are really powerful. So let's look into one of the examples. So, uh, we want to see um, the managers of our employee table and not only the managers, but also the overall sum of the department salaries of every employee in the department and also the number of employees in the department. So by coding this, I don't have to, I, I don't need any group by because of the OLAP functions. I say em, employee number, last name and salary, also the count star from uh, uh, from from my work depth. This is the number of employees and some salary also partitioned by work depth. So per department is uh, salary from employee where job is manager because I just want to see the managers. And this is what I get. This is a little awkward because the number of, of employees seems to be one and the department salary seems to be a little low. Actually, it's exactly the salary of the manager. So this seems a little strange. So unless the manager is just managing himself, this is not true. And, and if you know the employee table, you see this is not okay. So that's not working. This is not correct. It's a wrong result because yeah, because the very condition gets evaluated before the all up function. So all the employee data is filtered down to the managers only. And with only the managers, the select count and the sum salary is done. And of course, if you just count the manager, it is one. And if you just look sum the, his salary, it's just the salary he got. Okay, so that's a really, really important thing to, to remember. Using OLAP functions, the where conditions are always evaluated upfront. Upfront, the OLAP functions. Extremely, 
important. So how could we solve that? Well, we could use a common table expression. So we just run the OLAP function on the whole table. We don't, um, we don't limit, we don't filter the employee table when we run the count star and the sum salary. And in a second query, in the final query, where we query the common table expression, we filter the result down to manager. And this is in the end, oh, sorry, I have to step back. Uh, and this is now the correct answer. This is much more that uh, of a department salary and there are 11 people in, the, in department D11 and seven people in department D21 and so on. So this really worked. So remember that filtering is done in a, in a second step uh, if you use a common table expression. Um, otherwise, the filtering would be done if you do it in a single SQL statement, it would be done upfront the OLAP evaluation. Uh, the evaluation of the OLAP function. Okay, important to know. If you use them frequently, you probably know that already. But um, I really want to encourage everyone to 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 have a closer look into OLAP functions because they are really nice and powerful. And I do have a second business problem regarding OLAP functions. Let's look at this second example sum of amount that's what we want and we we want the last value of sales date and unit price per customer and product you see the customer there are two customers in this little example i just have a single product and i do have uh some amounts a couple of dates and unit prices and the unit price changed from 14.79 uh, to 16.2 for the customer uh, 3355 and so on. And the last sales date, remember that one is the 2nd September 22. Okay, how could we do this? Well, again, all our functions come in handy and we use a first approach which says, well, customer number, give me the customer, give me the product. We want sum of amount, of course, per customer and product, yes. We want the last value of sales state, that was the request, last value of sales state, also per customer and product. Of course, order by sales state. We want the last value, last value in the time sequence. We want the last value of the unit price, which is which was in the example, the highest price. The last price where we did some interaction with our customer from product sales. So we don't have a wear condition, so we don't run into the same problem we just had. We don't filter it up front. It is the whole table and let's do this. So what's the result? Well, sum of amount looks pretty good. It seems to work. But on the other side, the last sale date and the last unit price seem a little confused because they are all different values. And we, we would expect only the last value, only the 2nd September in all of the cases or um, and the price of, of 16, 1620 in all of that. So it did not work. So um, the colleague who, who ran into this problem was pretty creative. He said, well, this is a problem. I have no idea why this doesn't work but I could think of an alternative solution. And there's a last value. And, uh, and, and of course, DB2 also knows a first value. So what if I rewrite this query and if I specify first value here and I just have to add the order by, reverse the order by and do it sales state descending, it, it, it should work as well. It should be the similar example or a similar um, approach, just the other way around. Think just the other way around. So this word didn't work and he thought of another scenario of a other problem solution. What he did is he did first value exactly the same and in the order by he added a descending. So what's the result here? Well, wow, looks good. Um, of course, I, uh, I, le uh, I left out the, the distinct clause uh, uh, after the select because I wanted to, to show this case here. 
and um, we got the right sum. We got really the 2nd of September in, in this example as a, sale, a last sale and the price is 16.2 like expected. So, wow, this worked just the other way around. Okay, why that? Well, I guess first value works, last value didn't work. So, this is a bug, DB2 failure, we should open a ticket. Oh, no, it's not a bug actually. We missed something. We did not specify a OLAP window. And um, for first value and last value, you have to specify a OLAP window in order to explain which rows do you refer to. And the OLAP window is missing. And because it's missing, DB2 jumps in and said, well, if he didn't specify a OLAP window, he is, I'm doing some default stuff. Huh? And, and this gives us, this example really gives us a great um, point to, to, re, to rehearse that one and to, to have a closer look at the OLAP window once more, um, because it's really useful. And this is the point where I, I, I came in. Uh, it took a while because it's quite tricky that the one, the one worked and the other one didn't work, but I can, I can explain it to you. So, I rewrote the query to last value and we just added the rows between. So this is the OLAP window. We partition by customer and product. That's not changed in any way. We order, not changed in any way. But we, in, in this OLAP window, we tell DB2 um, where does the last value refer to it? It refers to rows between unbound preceding and unbounded following. And what does this mean? Well, this means actually it refers to the customer and product and to all the rows with the same customer and product, to the partition. It refers to the partition. So this means give me the last value of where, where the rows here, the product and the customer doesn't, did not change. And it looks at, at these one, two, three, four, four rows overall and says, give me the last value of these four rows. And obviously this is 6.2 and um, the 2nd of, of September. Okay, and, and the same for the last value of unit price, exactly the same. This is the maximum all up window, all the rows preceding and all the rows following, regarding, uh, referring to the partition by clause, of course, to a single customer and a single product. And because it was missing, DB2 used the default and the default and I, I really, I, I, I have to admit that I had to look it up. The default depends on whether an order buy is specified or not. And in, in our case, the order buy, of course, was specified. So our OLA window was all rows preceding, meaning all rows preceding and non following. And this is the original table in this example. And, and this is where we want to, to make up um, the, the OLAP window example once again. So if I, if DB2 scrolls down by reading the data, scrolls down from row to row, this is the first row. And of course, if, if my OLAP window is all the, all the rows preceding, it's just this row. So what's the last value? If I don't specify an OLAP window, the last value is my current value. And if DB2 gets to the next row, what's the last value? Well, it's my current value. And if it goes down, it's always the current value. And this is why it changed in our example where we did not have the correct OLAP window specified and where we used last value. It was always the current row. Why did the first value work? Yeah, because the first value is the first value when I'm here. If I go to the next row, it's still the first value, it's still in my OLAP window, it's still the, first, uh, the 1479 and, and stuff like that. Because it was reversed, it worked, the order by. And, and this is how you can explain it. So using the OLAP window makes up this red dotted line or red dotted area right when you're in the first position here. So what's the last value if I look in my in my red dotted line rectangle, it's 16.2. And because I specified this as my OLAP window, it worked. Okay, a little tricky, 
but some of the OLAP functions really need an OLAP window specified. Uh, you don't need this for some, for max, for min, but you need it for last and first and stuff like that. Okay, so a little more tricky. Good to know OLAP windows work, OLAP functions work and are really efficient, but look it up if you, if you get run into any problems. Okay, so what's next on our agenda? It is outer join confusion, as I called it. Outer joins are frequently used in my environments, in data warehouse environments. They come in really, really useful in order to enhance information from other lookup tables. And um, just a small recap. We don't have any beginners um, as the, the poll in up front uh, this session showed. So I will go over that quite, quite quickly. We do have left, right, full out the joins. They enrich data used in data warehouse environments as said. I have two tables here for my little examples and we make it up. We have two key columns. They are here, the, the, the letters and um, we do have on the left join we have the, the blue table, which is called the row preserving side. And we have the table two, which is the right one. It's the null producing side. And uh, DB2 shows what, what, what matches up. And we will return all the rows where we have some, some blue um, information. It could be extended if I have two Cs in here. And this is why, why the orange table, the table two is called null producing side because whenever a key value is not found in table two, uh, null is returned for all the values in table two. Okay, so this is just what an outer join is, is, is doing, pretty simple. So, talking about joins, what's the difference between these two statements? Or is there a difference? Again, still the offer, raise your hand, uh, you get unmuted, you can talk to us if you have any ideas, if you know that, just speak up. Would be nice to talk to some of, uh, some of you. We actually have a couple of hands raised. I'm gonna, yes, I'm gonna, go on. I'm gonna unmute Chuck if you're there, Chuck. Yes. Oh, I, uh, you're self muted. I think I can, uh, you have to just hit the unmute button and you're in the attendee list and you can uh, speak up, I believe. Chuck, are you there? Anyone else? Um, let me, uh, yeah, and Peter has his hand up or did. Let me see. Hand is down now. Okay. I've also got. Well, so I, I guess a couple of you know that. Uh, yeah. But I think this is yeah. could be tricky as well. For if, if you haven't uh, looked closer into it, it is, is quite. Uh, yeah, uh, Chuck said it's not working for him. I, uh, I might have to promote him. Chuck is one of these guys I'd make a panelist anyway, because he's just a, such a nice guy. Um, let's see if I, if I did that correctly. Big panelist. Okay. And I said, yes. Okay, Chuck, you should be a panelist now, which means you can unmute yourself and speak up. Hi, this is Chuck. Yes, Hi, Chuck. I can hear you. Hey there. Yeah. Well, the the um, the um, filter on department is applied in different places. Yes. In those two queries. Yes. Can you yeah. So uh, on the right side, the filter is on the whole statement and on okay. the left side. It's on the join. It's just on the join. Yeah. So actually, uh, thanks Chuck for, for, uh, for your comment. That's great. Um, in, in this case, the result set is not limited in any way. What we limit with this additional join condition, because it's in the on clause, it's part of the on clause, it's just, we're just limiting down 
the rows from the department table, which are joined against the employee table. So we are limiting the join. We are not limiting the result. And in the where condition, it's a filter of the result set. And this is completely different. So what we get is completely different. Whoever has worked with the employee table knows that 20, uh, 42 rows is the whole table. So the table is not filtered at all. We get a some fewer joints. We just get the rows joined from the department where the department number is A00. Otherwise, we won't get any, any values. We get the nulls. And here, because we limit it to the A00, we just get six rows. So it's a huge difference. And it, it, it takes maybe some time to think about it. And in order, uh, I, I hope this will help. This is the simplest example I could make up, actually. It is creating a, a table, inserting a, a row, two rows, row one with well, letter A and row two with letter B. And then I made up this union all query, where the first query, where we did the join example, where we added it to the on condition of the join. We joined the join test uh, um, table to itself. And we did the same here, but we uh, added the, where, uh, the, the BID equals one to the where condition. And that's the result. So for query, query one, we get two results. We get, we get two rows, including the null side, where it is not joined because we just joined where ID is one. So there wasn't anything joined, so we get the nulls. And we just get the one row where BID equals one for the second query. So if you wanna play around, if you, if you think uh, it's, it's worth trying, uh, I think this is not known so well by by a lot of people and um, it, it's worth a closer look so this is something to play around not, not not a lot to type or to copy and you can do some experiments of your own so because this is just a simple example we want to go into a little more detail a little more, more complex environment and I took one of my practical experiences or examples uh, into this session. And um, well, the other day we had following scenario. We needed to delete data. It was in a, in a data warehouse environment actually. And uh, we needed to delete rows where uh, two timestamps are equal. The input timestamp and history times are equal. But of course, uh, there's a, an exception to most of, to, uh, to every rule. And the exception was, uh, don't do it if a so-called revival exists, where an ID exists. A revival means, well, it's deleted, but it's here again, something like that. And uh, so before I, I try to do deletes, I try to check things. I, I, I like to check things. So I, I said, well, let's, let's see if the revivals are are there if 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 I get returned what what really what I expected, and uh, this was the query which was in place for that. So select star from from a table, a history table, a current H, current table A uh, equals or joined on the ID column, and the ITS timestamp equals the HTS timestamp, and where the ID. The, uh, so the revival is not null. So where a revival, uh, uh, revival exists. So these are the rows I don't want to delete and I want to check if, if, if I get the right, uh, um, the right result set. So this worked. And so this is fine. So no, no, no problems here. Uh, and now the, the task is to delete, simply delete all, um, um simply to select all that can be deleted which should be exactly the opposite of of, of this query right so let's do it simply con convert this select to a delete this is pretty simple because you see you say delete from from table uh, and then specifies the, the select and the select just needs to return the opposite well and AD is not null was the original statement. So just, just leave out the not, right? I think, can imagine this is pretty straightforward, but it is a problem. 
you delete the, <laughs> do you delete rows you don't want to do, delete really why that what went wrong in this case and there are two problems really and the first problem is the original statement was worked it was fine but it was defined suboptimal i i would call it you can also say stupid but suboptimal is is, is nice i i guess um because it was an inner join it was an, a coded left join with, which was an effective inner join why that well let's step back left join table h left join table a but if you select something from table a here in your where condition where is not null you uh, you expect a value in id in a dot id and if you don't if you only return things that have values in a id this is an inner join i show you why let's go to this example i just explained the the left out the join in this left out the join we have the row preserving and the null producing side but what we did because we expect some a certain value we left out we said we suppressed all the nulls and if you remove all the null information in table two it is an inner join right you specified an outer join but you easily can transform it to an inner join if you do something like a some some column of the right table is not null or, or is a certain value and this was done here and in addition to that it the the condition of the timestamp the comparing of the timestamp was done in the on clause well again this is not wrong if this is an inner join because if it's an inner join it doesn't matter if you specify this in the on clause or in the where clause it's exactly the same it's the same result so it was an effective inner join it worked and now because we removed this not null it converted back to a left join and in that point this situation or this this uh, um, ITS equals HTS was in the wrong place this should move down there into the where condition but this wasn't changed because somebody thought well it's easy to to get the opposite just remove the not and this was where everything got worse because a lot of rows were deleted and it was a mess okay so reversing the condition changed the behavior and made this suboptimal SQL a mess. Not easy to see, I would say. This is really, really tricky. So be aware. That's what I showed. Be aware. Do not filter the inner table in a where condition of an outer join. Yeah. If you have an outer join and you join to whatever is the, the inner table or is the table uh, which is which has the null producing side, if you select certain values there, convert your outer join to an inner join. Much better, safer, better way to go. And remember, the where condition will filter rows of your result. If you have it in an on clause, it just filters what gets joined it does not filter your result set at all it just determines what rows to join this is a very very important outcome of this part of my presentation okay so last on our agenda we are going to play around with nulls a little bit and um, also, I have an interesting uh, scenario, one more interesting business scenario. Um, first, about talking about nulls. You can say where, where some column is null, is not null. Equals null actually will not work. And so do less than, greater than, and, and stuff are not valid clauses. So you have to say is null or is not null. Um, 
nullable col uh, columns in calculations always return null. 10 plus null is null. C test concat null is null. Well, actually you could say null is the Chuck Norris of the database, you know, because null can compare it to anything. Can't be compared to anything. Okay? And Chuck Norris can't be compared to anything as well. So null is the Chuck Norris of the database. It gets a little bit more interesting if you do some column functions regarding null, like a sum of uh, salary or average of salary, and I, I show this in a moment. There's only there's also exception to this rule because, because null equals null in, in one case in a group by. In a group by, all the null values are yeah, returned in a single row, and this is where you could say that in, in that case, null equals null. So, little example, I, uh, I create a table of five rows. Um, four rows do have names, three rows do have salaries. And then I, we calculate the sum, the average, the min and the max. And the average is, is 20,000, which is actually the average if you just refer to the three rows, not to the four, not to the five. So this may bias your data. Uh, um, maybe you expect 12,000, but, but because of null, this is handled differently. So have a, right, have an eye on the null values in a column if you do averages and stuff and make sure that uh, the value um, you expect gets returned. You of course could, could uh, specify zero instead of null for that column value, but be aware of that. So this might produce problems as well. A uh, little bit more interesting, remember this, five rows, four of them have names, one of them is Huber. And uh, what we select now is select star from this, from this little null test table, where name is not equal Huber. Only three rows are returned. Why that? We have five rows and only one was Huber. So not four rows returned, but three, because null does not qualify. Null can be compared to anything. That's what it just said. And the not equal is probably the most complicated thing to think about, that even a not equal null is not true. Okay, so only three rows are returned. If you want to return the null, you have to say or name is null. Okay, so it's really important to do the, the null um, thing and, and I personally really have with not in or, or not equal um, these are really tricky if, if, if you're into nulls because it's, 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 a, it's a, the hardest way to imagine if you have uh, these comparisons. So I came up with this uh, condition table here in just to make, to, just to show you where, where the null gets into an A, A and B. You have A and B column with true and false and null and what gets returned. So be aware of the nulls getting returned. By doing this presentation, I always learn something as well. I learned that there is something, there is a way to work around that nulls. There is a very interesting predicate, a predicate I was not aware of really. There's a distinct predicate. I would, I'm really curious who knew this distinct predicate from the audience today. It is, there's a predicate, we all know the select distinct column, blah, 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 from table, but this is a predicate. It is, is distinct from, and is not distinct from. And in using this, you, uh, null is never returned. So you can avoid these null scenarios if you use is distinct from clause, the predicate. And it's actually available in DB2, in, it became available in 11.1 .1 in modpack one, so it was not in 11.1 from from the beginning. It, it was added in mod one. This is why uh, maybe why I overlooked it. I didn't see it. I didn't realize it. 
And it also there in DB2 COS uh, from version eight on. So pretty interesting. And because I thought this is interesting, I extended that table to show you whenever a null was returned in the normal A and B and stuff, it's, it's true and it's false. You, you will never get a null return. Okay, A is distinct from B or A is not distinct from B. Interesting stuff I learned putting together this, this presentation. So now I know I'm, I'm not actively using it because you have to get used to it really. But, but it's, it's, I think this is really important to know and, and uh, some interesting things you could, you could learn and try out your own. Let's go to our last example, a subselect. We had a subselect with a not in. So like uh, dimension time is not in select from whatever, the status is in A, B, and C. Just simplified, a simplified example. Um, and uh, through a, a change to the application, we need to rewrite it. And the, the not in got converted to a join. To a left outer join, so this tab was was in uh, into the left the left join tab, on whatever, uh, uh, and in the where condition we said not in A, B, and C. But as you might expect already, the result set is not identical. The left join also leaves the option for a non-match, and the non-match means for nulls. So in order to to get the equal results, we had to add the null option. This means we had to say left join where status not in A, B, and C, or status is null. Okay, so that's important. This is basically the same, the same problem scenario I just just showed you, and uh, but it's it's really hard to to remember and to. To be aware of that, that once you change your query, you have to think of nulls, and you might have to add to add such such additional conditions, or status is null in order to receive uh, the identical result set. Okay, I used up my time pretty much. So the only things is I wanted to point out to some interesting presentations. Um, Good and bad nulls from Chan Manpa uh, really recommend it. It's it's an old IDAC presentation. Um, if you if you log on to IDAC, it's a free free account. You can download some of the presentations from older from older uh, conferences. And this is a pretty current one from the North American 22 conference uh, by Callisto Society. The power of all up functions really recommended as Callisto is is the um, SQL guy in DB2. Uh, uh, absolute fantastic stuff and lots, lots of things to learn. If you liked uh, my session today, this is my email address and my Twitter handle. I would be happy if you if you follow me on Twitter and uh, I'm sharing a, a lot of DB2, IDOC and, and stuff information. And uh, thanks for listening. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to speak up, to chat, whatever, or to contact me after the session no problem. So thanks for listening. And I hope you enjoyed the session and you learned a little bit. Uh, thanks, Michael. We'll get some inspiration. So back to you, Martin. Thanks for having me today. Oh, it's been great to have you here. It's always good to have some interesting insights and things that, um, that help people. So with that in mind, I've got one last duty I must do is uh, to thank our host again, uh, our founder of uh, DBI and also asked our last polling question, which is, did you learn anything today? We always like to know if people are finding the show of value and we find that people are voting. I hope free. so. And uh, I'm going to close that and share that. Uh, Thank you very much. That's good to hear. That's the re result we always like to see because it means that people did, in fact, learn a lot from the show and, and uh, it's great to see. So we appreciate you. Uh, taking the time to share your knowledge with us, uh, Michael. It's uh, late in your day, it's near six o'clock there. Yeah, you're welcome, you're very welcome. Always a pleasure to be on your show. Appreciate that. So with that, I'll cue the music and uh, we'll uh, start our uh, 
the rest of our Friday activities so we can get on with our uh, evening and uh, enjoying the weekend, I hope. So with that, thanks, thanks again for all for attending. Uh, appreciate you being here, and we will see you in two weeks for uh, Roy Boxwell on a System Z show. Have a great weekend. Thanks again, Michael. All the best. Bye-bye. Thanks. Same for you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye.